All right. Hi, welcome everybody to another live webinar from PALCUS. My name is Angela Samos, and I'm here with Dr. Dulce Maria Swatter Scott from Anderson University. Welcome, Hello, Dr. Everyone. Scott. So uh, you might be wondering, what is this survey about and why did we do this survey? And, you know, the, we receive, as, a, as the national organization representing Portuguese Americans, we receive a lot of media queries and queries from research organizations and org you know, other entities about uh, the Portuguese community. How many are there? What do, how do people feel about something? And given this last election year, we received a lot of inquiries about, well, how do Portuguese Americans vote? Do they vote mostly Democrat? Do they vote mostly Republican? And we also started to see commentary on this topic, whether it was in another webinar or in a written article where people claim to know how Portuguese Americans vote. One said, oh, I think they vote mostly Democrat. And another one said, well, everybody that I know votes Republican. And the truth of the matter is that's purely anecdotal data. And Palkus is really working hard to establish multiple data benchmarks about the Portuguese American community um, based on actual research. So not just anecdotes. And so, as you know, we've done the um, national survey called the, the Palkus Index. Um, we did a survey many years ago with Dr. Scott about whether or not Portuguese uh, Americans prefer to be referred to as Hispanic or not. And so we are going through the process of collecting this data so that when there is a need to report on the community, the reporting is done based on fact and, and research, not just on anecdotes. And so that's purely the reason that we did this survey and it's exploratory. We wanted to see what the results would be. Um, it was a very, as you'll see in the questions that Dr. Scott will walk through, they were very matter of fact. They were not leading questions or anything like that. And it was a nonpartisan. So the purpose of the survey is not to push one side or the other. We just purely just wanted to see how people voted. What's, what's the breakdown? And again, and as Dr. Scott will show you, this isn't a purely represent, this isn't a representative survey, right? Because we only did it via Facebook. And so only those that are on Facebook were able to answer the survey. So again, it's exploratory, but it gives us um, a, a little bit of a stake in the ground, the first data point that we can then continue doing more research, uh, continue um, you know, going down this path to, to become more educated and, and have actual data about our community so people aren't um, just sort of making stuff up. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Scott to share her screen and walk us through the survey results okay, and I'm even gonna... talk about the methodology a little bit. So yeah, so go ahead. And um, we'll go through the data, uh, but first through an introduction. There's one more. Okay. Uh, can you see it, Angela? Okay. So that's the title. It's an exploratory survey because it's not based on a representative sample. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do it based on a representative sample. So um, this, again, we already said this, so I'm going to skip to the next page. And um, at one point, Angela was asked whether Portuguese Americans we're switching from the Democratic to the Republican mm -hmm. Party, so I included yeah. that here. And uh, so before answering that question, uh, I went to the theory and uh, to the, specifically to the work of Robert Dahl. <laughs> he is a, a prominent uh, political scientist in the United States, was a prominent political scientist. And he basically studied the political integration of immigrant groups in America. And he stated that working class immigrant groups due to shared class interests, since basically upon arrival, almost everyone is in the same class, um, in the working class, uh, that they would exhibit a uniform behavior. And in the areas where um, the, uh, that were industrial, labor unions, you'd play a major role in mobilizing the vote of Portuguese Americans, as well as Italians, Irish, and so on, 
<clears throat> because um, they were involved in the unions. Uh, but he admitted that there were some exceptions to, um, to these, that, uh, for example, in New Haven, Italian Americans had integrated politically through the Republican Party, and he attributed that to the fact that the democratic apparatus in New Haven, Connecticut had been already taken over by Democrats, and so there was no room, I mean, by Irish Americans, and so there was no room for the Italians there. And until this day, Italian Americans in New Haven vote Republican. Uh, the same thing could perhaps apply to the Portuguese Americans of the Central Valley and inland areas in California that have been predominantly a Republican. So if you want to become a, a politician there, you have to run through the Republican Party. And uh, so, so you know, once our group gets, people from our group get in, then they begin to mobilize the vote of the population to the party in which they are involved in. Uh, notwithstanding, the theory then said that as the population became more integrated and some immigrants became wealthier than others, their children got more education, et cetera, that then the vote, you'd become more differentiated between the political parties and that uh, eventually you did come to be the same or to mirror the vote of the general American population. So in addition to Bell's theory uh, concerning the political integration of immigrants, uh, various other socioeconomic factors are related to voting behavior, age, gender, marital status, education, income, occupation, state of residence, area of residence, whether rural, rural or urban, religious affiliation, level of religiosity, among others. In this survey, we did not ask about religious affiliation and religiosity. If we do this again, we should include those questions. Uh, Catholics traditionally voted for the Democratic, the Democratic Party, but this again, it's probably because of the connection between um, Catholicism and uh, immigrant groups that came uh, destined to the manual labor market. Uh, but nowadays in a different social structural uh, context in the United States, it is possible that conservative social values such as opposition to abortion have become more relevant cues in the political choices of Portuguese American Catholics. There were well over a thousand people that replied to the survey. We eliminated people who were 18 years of age because they couldn't vote. And we also took out people that were not, not citizens because they're not permitted to vote in the United States as well. Uh, and here we go. These are the, the political views of survey respondents. And as you can see, 42.9% uh, said that their political orientation was democratic and 28.6% said that their political orientation was Republican and then 17 independent. Now comparing these to the US population as a whole, around a third of registered voters in the US, that is 34%, are independents. So we had uh, underrepresentation of independents here, uh, while 33% are, are Democrats and 29% are Republicans. So on the Republican side, we're very close uh, uh, among Portuguese Americans, at least the ones that took this survey, 42.9% uh, were Democratic in orientation. Moving on, uh, there's no data, say from the 70s, 80s, or even 90s that we could, can compare to in terms of the orientation, uh, the political orientation of, of people uh, in the Portuguese community. But I did a survey in 2010 of Luso descendants, that is uh, of people that had arrived in the United States as teenagers and people that had been born here. It did not include people that immigrated as adults. And as you can see, the predominant view was middle of the road, tending to liberal and very liberal, but we also have very conservative people. So it was never true that Portuguese Americans were all Democrats uh, and 
perhaps it's also not true that they are moving towards the Republican. There may be some movement, but it's not huge. I, I do think there has been some movement, you know, the Trump factor, the, the promise of returning factory jobs, uh, Portuguese people might, uh, might have found that to be attractive. Um, but uh, generally, uh, this is what we found. So in terms of voter turnout in 2016, the Pew Research Center stated that around 87% of registered voters cast a ballot in two, uh, 2016. Among the people in our survey, it was 93.4%. So uh, we, we can't say from these that Portuguese Americans have high rates of turnout because again, it's not a representative sample, but also there's close to 25% of uh, Portuguese Americans who are not Americans, they're just Portuguese, uh, according to the American Community Survey of 2019. So at least, you know, 25% of us don't vote uh, anyway. But the uh, Portuguese American Citizenship, Citizenship Project, PACP, which was um, a project funded by FLAD that was um, run by Mr. Uh, McGlinchey, uh, they did find that once Portuguese Americans registered to vote that they did have a high level of turnout. How did uh, people in this survey voted, voted? How did they vote? Uh, basically, Hillary Clinton received 59.4 and Donald Trump received 33.5. This is again in the 2016 elections and then uh, the other candidates received um, 4.5 between them. Uh, there were other local candidates running that we did not include here. But if you go back to the political views, uh, you see that uh, Hillary Clinton did quite, uh, did, you know, she, had, she did better than this, and so did Donald Trump to some extent, although uh, Hillary Clinton had more of an edge here. So this means that some people that were independent voted for Hillary or they voted for um, Donald Trump. But other than that, uh, there's a, a very high level of correlation between the two variables, between political orientation and how people voted. Now, voter turnout in 2020, we had an extremely high level of voter turnout among the people that participated in this survey. And, I mean, of course, you know, people self-selected into this survey. So uh, if people voted, if they didn't vote, they probably weren't that interested in replying to this survey. Uh, but the, in the US as a whole, the voter turnout was record high. In 2020, it was 6.1% higher than in 2016. And this is how people voted. So 63%, 63.0% voted for Joe, Joe Biden and 34.5% uh, voted for Trump. So Trump did better than he did in 2016 among this group. And then uh, Biden did a lot better than Hillary Clinton did. She got 594 and uh, Biden got 63.2, which means uh, that probably some of the people that voted independent or for third, I mean, that voted for other party candidates or even write-in candidates then gave their votes to Biden and some also to Trump. Uh, the two, again, the two uh, variables, the 2016 vote and the 2020 vote are highly correlated, uh, but there were some changes that were more favorable to Biden than to Trump. Among the people who voted in 2016 for a, a writing candidate or a third party candidate, 31 voted for Biden, whereas 14 voted for Trump. The people that had not voted in 2016, 32 voted for Biden, 15 for Trump. And then 15 people switched from Clinton to Trump and then 15 switched from Trump in 2016 to Biden 
in 2020. So that those are the results. Now we're going to do uh, correlations uh, between the various variables, starting with country of birth and how people voted in the 2020 election. We had 59% um, of the participants were born in the United States. And um, then we have 21.2 in Portugal, continent, uh, Azores, and then the data. So among those born in Portugal, over 61% were born in the continent, 36% in the Azores, and 3% in the data. This is probably an overrepresentation of people from the continent because we do think that there are more Azorians than people from the continent in the United States. Uh, so uh, in terms of the voting behavior by country of birth, we found that there was no relationship, regardless of whether you were born in the United States or born outside the United States, people basically voted the same. Um, we have people voting for Biden and, and for uh, Trump, um, whether, you know, the same, whether they're born here or outside of the United States. In terms of age, uh, this was our age distribution. According to the Pew Research Center, the American voting population is aging. This is actually good for the Republican Party because older people tend to be more conservative. So 52% uh, of registered voters are ages 50 and older, up from 41% in 1996. So in, other, in our survey, 72.4% are 45 years of age or older and 47% are um, 55 or older. Now we know that our immigrant population is aging and that overall Portuguese Americans are a little older than the average for the United States as a whole. And this should again, should favor the uh, Republican party. <clears throat> Uh, for the entire U.S. population, the median age is 38.5. For all Portuguese Americans, it's 41 years. And for those born in Portugal, it is 59.6 years. That's the immigrant group. Now, there, there is a relationship between voting behavior and age. As you can see, younger people, in particular below 44, we're more likely to vote for Biden. And then the people up here in these three age categories voted more or less the same. Um, so let's continue to this. And, and again, uh, okay, let's continue this. So our results show trends that conform to some extent to those found in the general American population with younger persons tending to vote for Biden and or older individuals being more likely than younger people to vote for Trump. And I will let you read this. This is a, a quote about how Americans voted by age. And you can see how these relations, the younger people are, the more likely they are to vote Democratic. Uh, and Trump actually carried some of the older age, age groups in the United States as a whole. Now, gender. I, I was happy to see that um, we have a gender balance. And when I say balance is because this is more or less the difference in gender that we have in the American community survey. Uh, so uh, six respondents preferred not to answer this question. So I don't know what they are. And voting by gender. And this is where it gets interesting. As you can see, women in this survey were 10.5% more likely to vote for Biden than they were to vote for Trump. Uh, the men, there's a, a difference as well, uh, but they were 10% more likely than men were to vote for Trump. And this corresponds to the gender gap at the national level. At AP VoteCast showed a 9% point difference between men and women in support for Biden and Eras. Uh, 55 of women and 46% of men. Uh, so ours match the national level, but in our sample, although uh, by, a smaller, uh, by a smaller number, uh, men were also more likely to vote for, for Biden than for Trump. 
Now the state of, of residence, we in, I included in this table states in which there were 14 or more respondents. And as you can see uh, in California, 14.7% of the sample. So, so we have overrepresentation of California, or if you will, an underrepresentation of some of the other states. Uh, but again, because there's a lot of Portuguese Republicans in California, these you'd favor the Republican. Uh, th th this um, survey you'd be biased in, uh, in terms of Republican presence. Um, I, we found no relationship between the state in which people lived and their voting preferences. And I think, I think this has to do with the fact that Portuguese Americans are concentrated in states that are dominated by the Dem Democratic Party. And so they're much more likely to vote Democratic just because of what state they live in. Uh, we did find that in all the states among the people that participated in the survey, Biden won. But in reality, uh, Trump, I mean, in the United States as a whole, Trump won Florida and Texas. But of course, these are small sample sizes by the time you get to the state level. And so we can't really conclude that Portuguese Americans in Florida gave the vote to either one or the other uh, in Florida or in Pennsylvania. I mean, in, uh, I'm sorry, in Texas. Uh, so in addition to that, this is state level data. If you go to city level and county level, there are some areas that where the, Dem the Democratic Party dominates even in Republican uh, controlled uh, states. Uh, level of education. The level of education is very high among our respondents. 98.7% have a high school degree or higher and 63.2% have a bachelor's degree or higher. According to the 2019 American Community Survey data, 88.3% of Portuguese Americans have a high school or higher level of education and 31.6% have completed a bachelor's degree or higher. And of course, this varies, varies quite a bit from state to state. I mean, California, Texas, etc. have Portuguese Americans in those states have very high levels of education. And then in uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, they tend to have lower levels of education. And we definitely found a very clear relationship between level of education and how people voted. The higher the level of, it's a, a direct relationship, a direct positive relationship, the higher the level of education, the higher the, um, I mean, the more likely people are to vote for Biden. And uh, this corresponds to national data published by the Pew Research Center stating that voters who identify with the Democratic Party or lean toward it are much more likely than their Republican counterparts to have the college degree. Uh, in 1996, the reverse was true. So we don't know. So, but in any case, this would, given the high level of education, this would give a, a Democratic bias to, to our sample. But I also think that bias is compensated by the state and uh, by the age of our respondents and also by the marital status to which we are going to go uh, next. The marital status, 71.5% of the people in this survey were married. Over, and this is an overrepresentation of married people, which actually favors Republicans because the married people are more likely to vote Republican than uh, single people are. So um, according to 2019 American Surve uh, Community Survey data, 50.4% of Portuguese Americans are married. So we have, we have an overrepresentation of married people. Um, and in the entire population in US, only 47.6% is married. And you can see definitely that single never married respondents in this survey were much more likely to vote for Biden. And then, although Biden won in all 
the um, categories uh, that um, basically single people were much more likely to vote for Biden. And I, I couldn't find data on marital status for the 2020 election for the entire United States. I found exit poll data for the election of 2018, the midterm elections. And those show that unmarried people and particularly single women are more likely to identify with the Democratic Party than married people are. And this is what we found in our data, that single people were more likely to vote uh, for Biden and that um, women were more likely than men to vote for Biden. Level of income, uh, basically data from the American Community Survey, again from 2019, indicates that the median family income of Portuguese Americans is 93.899%, and for those born in Portugal is 82.932%. The mean income for our survey was around 120,000. Uh, of course, we can't really compare median and median, uh, but um, it does show that we had a population that's fairly uh, well off. Uh, however, you know, a lot of the respondents were from California and the median family income in California is one or two and it is 110 in New Jersey. Uh, so uh, again, uh, let's go to the analysis. Uh, we, there's no, in the data that we got, there's no clear, clear relationship between uh, voting behavior and income. Normally, uh, although we can't determine social class by income alone, uh, family incomes below 99,000 have been considered to be working class incomes. And estimates related to the overall working class vote in the US suggest that white working class men favored Trump over Biden. Nevertheless, estimates also suggest that working class support for Trump was much stronger in small towns and rural areas with the working class voting for Biden over Trump. Now conclusions, uh, this uh, survey provides insights that can serve as a foundation for dialogue on this subject matter, as well as for future research, more representative research. Uh, our data suggests that the majority of Portuguese Americans remains identified with the Democratic Party. This may partially be explained by the state of residence of this population. Again, we concentrated in states where the, the Democratic Party is dominant, except for the Central Valley in California. Uh, adding to these, most immigrant groups, including the Portuguese, settled in states with significant urban areas, and the vote estimates of, estimates of 2020 did show the rural-urban divide with voters in rural areas and small towns favoring Trump and those in large urban areas preferring Biden. So industrial states versus agricultural states, uh, and we, we, are more, we tend to be more concentrated in industrial states in the Northeast and then of course, there's that exception in California. Uh, additionally, in our data, we observed no impact related to the country of birth as both American born and born uh, in Portugal voted or outside of the United States voted in the same way. Uh, in terms of the other variables, younger voters, women, those with higher levels of education, as well as single people were more likely to vote for Joe Biden than Don Donald Trump. And this conforms to the national data on these variables. In terms of gender, there was a gender gap among our respondents, very similar to that found in the general American population. And uh, it was in our survey was 10.5 in the general American population was nine. Uh, one difference was that although the men were more likely to vote for Trump, uh, the men that participated in our survey, uh, they, they still, voted for Trump more than they did for, I mean, they, they voted for Biden more than they did for Trump. Sorry about that. This brings us back to Bell's theory of the stages of political incorporation of immigrants, whereby as integration into the receiving society progressed within and across generations, the political participation patterns of immigrants you become more diversified and mirror those of the wider society. To a large extent, the results of our survey suggest that at least among 
participants, uh, both immigrant and American born, uh, vote in patterns that are very similar to those of the wider American population. But, you know, uh, we did have a concentration of respondents who are very well integrated economically, educationally into American society. So uh, only a survey based on a representative sample that included representation from all sectors of Portuguese America, uh, you'd allow us to determine for certain whether this pattern holds true for all Americans. Last but not least, it should be then worthwhile to carry a study based on a representative sample. I've been um, playing around with the idea of using quota sampling techniques. This would be an involved, involved process. It would need uh, people at different universities in the areas where the Portuguese Americans are concentrated to collaborate, maybe involve their students, and we need funding to pay the students so that they can go out and do interviews uh, of specific Portuguese Americans. Uh, and uh, it's very hard to, it would be very hard for us to do a sample based on probability sampling. Uh, you know, like in California, we have over 300,000 uh, Portuguese Americans in Massachusetts, close to 300,000. Uh, but Massachusetts, for example, has 6 million people. I, and if I, we were to do these as the pollsters do, do where they, they have computer, um, they have a computer generate random numbers and then they call those numbers, it would, very, it would be possible that we didn't get any Portuguese American person in a, in a population of 6 million. Uh, so uh, I think that perhaps a quarter sampling technique could be the solution here. And I'll stop here and um, I'll let Angela take over. Sure. And we do have a, a couple of questions that have come in on Facebook. The first one Should is- Can I stop the share or leave it on? Uh, you can leave it. You can leave it on. I think okay. that's people <laughs> like looking at slides. Um, so we have the first question, which is, uh, will this data be available for public use? And so we will make this PowerPoint um, available for public use. It'll be on the PALCUS website. I just ask that when um, citing the data to be clear whether the data came from the PALCUS survey or the American Community Survey or other sources right. that Dr. Scott has sort of uh, noted here. Citation, a suggested citation. Yeah, usually preferred citation. Yeah. So um, um, that you mentioned the type the author, the title of the survey, and mm -hmm. then you mentioned Palkas as, as well. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, because, I mean, you've done a great job of incorporating the American Community Survey and other data from other sources. So I don't want people to be confused that all of those data points were part of our survey, that you just combined them as a point of comparison. Yeah. So just make sure that folks know to make the distinguish, distinguishing point when they reference yeah. the data. So for example, when I, give the data about all Americans here. Mm -hmm. Or uh, our data, that's a data that came from Graham Litch. Right. In 2020. So if you wanted to cite this data directly from us, then you, you'd say uh, da, 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 and Graham Schling cited in Scott 2021. Got it. Um, next <laughs> question. <laughs> Okay. Uh, next question was, when was the survey done and how? Um, so yeah. it was done earlier this year. Uh, we ran it from, I think it was uh, November to, do we have the dates actually? I, I don't remember. don't have the dates. We, I think it was, we might have started in December. Yeah, it was post election. I know that. Um, so well, it was either December. For things to settle down, right? Right, right. I can so, give that information because um, in the database I have the dates when responses begin. Oh, okay, great, great. So we'll maybe we'll update this slide deck with that information and then post the new yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. Um, as far as how it was conducted, uh, we published the survey link through the Palkus newsletter as well as on all of our social channels, so Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, and LinkedIn. 
So if you were connected to us on one of those channels and saw the survey, then that's how you were able to take, take the survey or if you received the link in a newsletter. But because of that, even though that does reach a large amount of people, it's still not representative of the entire Portuguese American uh, community yeah. uh, population. Um, so, uh, you know, and it's sort of the same situation with our PALCAS index survey, the national survey, where we're trying to find ways to expand and reach more people, whether it's through written version, whether it's, you know, partnering with other organizations. Um, but as we, again, this is a first time survey. I mean, I, I think this is the first time anybody ever has um, conducted a survey on this topic. So this is kind of an exploratory benchmark. And as we continue to do more research, we will put in measures to make sure that we have a more representative group and we'll see where we go in the future. And to add to that, then I download the data uh, to a SPSS file and uh, clean, up, clean it up and mm -hmm. do the analysis, run a few operations. And I, I you know, because, you know, it is for the general population, I don't do very complex, complex statistical analysis. I basically do um, frequencies and, and cross tabs. And on occasion, when I have some dots, I may run a regression analysis just for my own information, because I don't expect the general population to uh, know what, what um, to know uh, advanced statistical techniques. Right. Um, and so we don't have any other questions at this time, but this recording will be made available um, on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. And I'm going to go ahead and share um, just a couple slides that I would like uh, to share with everybody. Which is these here. So I'm just going to say that if you enjoyed this webinar and you thought the information was useful, and you think that having this kind of data is valuable for our community to please consider becoming a Powerpulse member. It's only $50 per year and you can easily become a member by going to our website. There's the join Palcus today button right at the top. Um, and at a minimum, please subscribe to our newsletter. Um, it's free, uh, just email address and your name and that's it. Uh, and it'll keep you posted on all of our initiatives and surveys like this so that you can answer. Um, oops, and that's, um, thank you for attending very much. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Scott, your work in well, this area are, for us has been amazing. Um, I really enjoy doing this work and I do hope that we can get some funding to involve other, to involve other universities and students in this project. We could combine questions from this type of questions with the overall index survey and just do one um, and um, you know, really get people out there. Uh, hopefully we can get some funding to pay students to, to be involved here. Yeah, that's a great point. So I will say anybody out there listening, if you're if all involved with or affiliated with a, a university or other institution, um, We'd in love to Portuguese partner with you and the Portuguese communities, yes, yeah. um, to contact us. We would love to have this be a, a collective effort. And like uh, Dr. Scott says, if we could get some funding to pay the students that, you know, makes it a little bit worthwhile for them. Um, but that way it's a, it's a collective effort. So please reach out if you have an interest. But uh, thank you, Dr. Scott. Your work has been invaluable, not only for, for the organization, for PALCAS, but for the community. I mean, we're, we're putting data out there that um, is, is, is historical, right? Like it's, it's there well, for the I, ages. I think some of the initiatives that Palkus has done lately have been informed by data that we've collected. And so it's very much so helpful for uh, organizations that represent Portuguese Americans to have data on the communities that they are representing. And, you know, we have national data, but say your organization in New York, you're gonna need data for New York. <laughs> you know, so. Right. Yeah. Well, with that, we're going to wrap it up, but thank you again so much. Thanks for all who uh, attended and watched and asked questions. Um, until next time. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. All righty. Bye-bye.